Just to confirm the news that Diana, Princess of Wales, has died in a car accident in Paris, which also killed her companion, Dodie Fired. I believe what has happened is a tragic loss at a young age to someone who has shown great courage and determination in drawing attention to serious issues. For the next few days, the family and the nation must have time to come to terms with this immense sadness and loss. I, for one, believe there are lessons to be drawn from her life and from the extraordinary and moving reaction to her death. I couldn't believe I was there, really just to see all those people with all those books. Just sums it up. What a person she was. I was the one that went out with my car brought people back to Kensington Palace in the back seat of my car underneath a blanket just to give the princess some love. And indeed, because she was such an iconic and popular figure, um, this huge outpouring of grief that we saw, not just in Britain, but globally, really reinforced the notion that she was people's princess of hearts and she was this iconic 20th century figure. Obviously, um, in, the, in the course of human affairs, the preparations for much older members of the family, of course, are very, very um, complete. I mean, everybody knows what they will do on big days and so forth, but this is not at all the case with younger members, and particularly with Diana. She was 36 years old. She was in the prime of life. She had everything, of course, that's, isn't it a cliche to say she had everything to live for, but certainly no one could have foreseen this. And I very much doubt if anybody is very clear about exactly how this situation will be handled. It's now the 31st of August, the late hours. I just returned from the theater. We've been to see Beauty and the Beast. Rather ironic, really. The princess used to say, that's the story of my life. And the phone rings. It's Lucia Fletcher de Lima, the Brazilian ambassador's wife in Washington. She said, Paul, CNN have just reported the princess is in an accident in Paris. Can you find out more? You've got her mobile number. I don't have it. Ring her.
and it rang and rang and rang. And I thought that's strange because in, in those days, mobile phones were in their infancy, but she always carried it with her. I didn't know that it was just ringing out on a marble top inside the suite at the, at the Ritz in Paris. I had no idea. We'll probably never know for certain, but the reason there were so many photographers here in the Place Vendôme last Saturday night was that they believed that Princess Diana and Dodie Fayed were about to announce their engagement. Dodie had already designed a ring for his princess, valued at more than £100,000. That's why the photographers wanted the pictures that night. That's why the princess and the man who may well have been about to become her fiancé sped off into the Parisian night to escape. But as the world now knows to its cost, it was a journey that was to end in tragedy, as the couple that appeared so happy together perished together in a high-speed crash in the underpass below me here at the Pont de l'Alma. First, we'd heard the princess had had head injuries and broken her arm. And then two o'clock in the morning, we heard that the injuries were more serious than they first thought. And it wasn't until about three o'clock that they told us that the accident had been fatal. And I was on the first flight to Paris the next morning. So early Sunday morning, I arrived in Paris and was taken straight by the British ambassador, taken to the hospital. And I remember going into the elevator and the elevator doors opening on the first floor and looking down the corridor and seeing two gendarmes stood outside of a door. And I thought, that's where she is. So I was led not to that room, but to the room next door, where I waited for a while with an Angl Anglican priest and a, and a Roman Catholic priest. Nurse Humbert was the French nurse on duty, small, petite nurse that could only speak broken English. And she came to me and said, Paul, would you like to go in to see the princess? I said, yes, I would. Balmoral Castle, where the dreadful news arrived in the small hours of this morning. Balmoral Castle, where sometime around four, the heir to the throne had to wake his two sons and break the news that their beloved mother was dead. The media and the police started gathering at the entrance to the castle, hardly believing what they'd heard. And then tourists, foreign and British, who came to see the royal family and to pay their respects. I stared for a while in disbelief and I watched the fan whirring on the side of the bed table and as it moved it moved the princess's hair and I could see her eyelashes moving and I took her hand and said wake up you're asleep aren't you wake up Promptly at 11.30, three royal black limousines swept quietly across the River Dee from the castle, down the drive. The Queen Mother was in the first car. Prince Charles and Princess William and Harry were in the second. The Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh in the last. They crossed the main road and drove up the hill, disappearing under the trees to Crathy Church. In the church, the service never mentioned Princess Diana by name, but the minister offered prayers for all those whose lives had been darkened by tragedy and grief. Then, after an hour of worship and prayer, the cars came back from the little church on the hill. At about one, two much smaller black cars drove out of the castle, 
the Prince of Wales was at the Wheel of the First on his way to Aberdeen Airport, London and Paris. At this moment, the whole royal family, with the exception of Prince Charles, are in Balmoral Castle behind me. The Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh and the two princes are expected to make their way south later today. Almost every newspaper seems to put out a special edition this morning, and it's assumed that almost everyone increased their print runs. Editors were coy about giving any figures, just as they've been shy this last 24 hours or so of giving interviews. We sold more. We sold lots and lots more. She's on the front of every paper, isn't she? Italian papers, Dutch papers, even Bosnian papers she's on the front of. A short walk from St Paul's, where the princess was married, and the local news agent had had a morning to remember. In death as in life, Diana was helping to sell newspapers. Twenty minutes ago, the Prince of Wales set off for Paris on a BAE 146. The two sisters of uh, Princess of Wales, uh, Jane and Sarah, uh, we know that he'll be landing at a military air force place, a fair force base near Paris, and then go to the hospital where his ex-wife's body is. from Mother Teresa, who said, Diana helped me to help the poor, and that's the most beautiful thing. She was very much concerned about the poor, and her attitude towards the poor was good. That's why she came close to me. She was a very great friend in love with the poor. She was like an ordinary housewife. She was a very good mother. Her attitude towards the poor was good. And the Archbishop of Canterbury has also spoken about Princess of Wales' personal qualities. He said she was a vibrant and beautiful woman. He said she sees the imagination of young and old alike, this beautiful woman was also a very vulnerable human being. But out of that vulnerability, he said, and weakness, if you like, came lots of strength, her passion, and her commitment to people. So I say one of hundreds of different tributes which has come from all over the world in the wake of Princess of Wales' death. All day and all evening here at Buckingham Palace, telegrams of condolence have been arriving from leaders around the world, including the Pope, who said he was deeply saddened. Many foreign dignitaries who have formed a close association with Diana have already expressed a desire to attend her funeral on Saturday. Tonight, it's said, the royal family wants to accommodate the wishes of as many of these leaders as possible. I remember 
saying to the princess's sisters and the queen, we in the north have our loved ones back for the night before the funeral. We have a sort, sort of a wake, a time where we can reflect about the life that's just finished and how it touched us. Wouldn't that be nice if you could do that with the princess? The final journey home, not yet the final farewell. The body of a princess so loved by her people leaving the sanctuary of the Chapel Royal in St. James's Palace on its way to rest one last night in Kensington Palace. Behind a coffin shrouded in the royal standard and adorned by a spray of her favorite white lilies, drove her two sons, Princes William and Harry, bringing their mother back home. On either side, just some of the millions who mourn. So many people, so silent, so sad. The night sky was casting its own shroud as the cortege passed in front of Kensington Palace, almost disappearing amidst the tens of thousands. And the Queen said, I think it's a very good idea because we can extend the route of the funeral. <laughs> Ever so practical, our Queen. <laughs> Instead of going from the Chapel Royal in, in um, the Mall to, to Westminster Abbey, which is a very short distance, they could stretch the funeral route across London to Kensington Palace. They were expecting two million people in London for the funeral, so how to accommodate them all? So my wish was granted. I was being purely selfish. I wanted the princess to come home. I thought it was fitting that the princess should spend her last night in the home which she spent most of her adult life, in a home which she brought up her children, where she lived. So she came home. The hearse brought her home and brought her into the room. And I asked if I could have permission to stay the night. And then I said, would any of the other members of the family like to come and join me? Would you like to come and visit? Because this is your last chance to say what you want to say and nobody came. So I sat there with the princess by myself and I pulled up a chair and I sat with her with my hand on the coffin and I talked to her about our time together, about our, our life, about the things that we'd shared. Sadly, I couldn't invite anyone else in, but I asked the policeman to bring in some of the flowers that the people had laid at the gates because she loved lilies. So I said, bring as many lilies as you can. So all the flowers, the room was full of flowers. And then I lit every candelabra we had, every candlestick we had, and the room was filled with candlelight and that intoxicating perfume of lilies. So I spent the night with her there and read her address book from beginning to end. That book was filled with the people who had filled her life. So I knew them all, so I could talk to her about them and what they'd said to me and what letters I'd had from them and how, how her passing had affected them. And it was really spiritual for me to do that. And I felt a strong presence in that room. I felt her there with me. And I stayed until the morning and then I heard the crunching of the gravel outside. And there was a gun carriage at the front door waiting to take her away. Then six very smart dressed guardsmen marched in and struggled with that coffin, which weighs half a ton. There are two coffins, a lead lined one and a normal one. And it was very, very heavy and an ordeal to get it out of the building. And then I followed in a car um, to Westminster Abbey. So my last duty was done at Kensington Palace.
Buckingham Palace has confirmed that the queue to sign the books of condolence at St James's Palace will close at 6 o'clock tomorrow night. Those queuing then will, of course, be allowed to sign. All 43 books will reopen at Kensington Palace at 2 o'clock on Saturday. The constant stream of mourners continues unabated, and last night our reporter Richard Gaysford joined them. He found a common bond as they waited for six hours in the rain and the dark. The thousands upon thousands have stood here in the last few days, patiently waiting in line. And there's no let up in the numbers coming to St James's Palace to pay their respects and to write in the books of condolence. The rain comes in heavy bursts, but it doesn't dampen spirits. In fact, it strengthens a feeling of camaraderie. Everyone here with one common purpose. and the Queen is now arriving at Westminster Abbey.
And as they gave the order to pull away, I remember bowing. I remember bowing for the last time. And saying, goodbye, your Royal Highness. Therefore, confident in the love and mercy of God, holding a living faith in God's mighty resurrection power, we, the congregation here, those in the streets outside, and the millions around the world, join one another and the hosts of heaven as we say together in whatever language we may choose, the prayer which Jesus taught us, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Queen was amused to see so many A-list Hollywood celebrities. And I said, but that's who her friends were. I would take calls from John Travolta and Tom Cruise and Tom Hanks on a regular basis. Even Michael Jackson came through my switchboard. So it wasn't unusual for me to put those names there, but maybe unusual for other people to see. Of course, Elton John was a close friend and David, um, George Michael, and they were all there. It did seem right to me as I sat in Westminster Abbey. I was sat amongst her friends. All the people she knew were around me. And, and of course Elton sang Candle in the Wind and there wasn't a dry eye in the house. And he said, I'll never sing that again. He said, I will never sing that in public again.
Let us commend our sister Diana to the mercy of God, our maker and redeemer. Diana, our companion in faith and sister in Christ, we entrust you to God. Go forth from this world in the love of the Father who created you, in the mercy of Jesus Christ who died for you, in the power of the Holy Spirit who strengthens you, at one with all the faithful, living and departed, may you rest in peace and rise in glory, where grief and misery are banished and light and joy evermore abide. Amen. The music of John Taverner will now lead to the minute's silence. <coughs>
the world sensed this part of her character and cherished her for her vulnerability whilst admiring her for her honesty. The last time I saw Diana was on July the 1st, her birthday in London, when typically she was not taking time to celebrate her special day with friends, but was guest of honor at a fundraising charity evening. She sparkled, of course, but I would rather cherish the days I spent with her in March when she came to visit me and my children in our home in South Africa. I am proud of the fact that, apart from when she was on public display meeting President Mandela, we managed to contrive to stop the ever-present paparazzi from getting a single picture of her. That meant a lot to her. These were days I will always treasure. It was as if we had been transported back to our childhood when we spent such an enormous amount of time together the two youngest in the family. Fundamentally, she hadn't changed at all from the big sister who mothered me as a baby, fought with me at school, and endured those long train journeys between our parents' homes with me at weekends. It is a tribute to her level-headedness and strength that despite the most bizarre life imaginable after her childhood, she remained intact, true to herself. There is no doubt that she was looking for a new direction in her life at this time. She talked endlessly of getting away from England, mainly because of the treatment that she received at the hands of the newspapers. I don't think she ever understood why her genuinely good intentions were sneered at by the media, why there appeared to be a permanent quest on their behalf to bring her down. It is baffling. My own and only explanation is that genuine goodness is threatening to those at the opposite end of the moral spectrum. It is a point to remember that of all the ironies about Diana, perhaps the greatest was this. A girl given the name of the ancient goddess of hunting was, in the end, the most hunted person of the modern age. She would want us today to pledge ourselves to protecting her beloved boys, William and Harry, from a similar fate. And I do this here, Diana, on your behalf. We will not allow them to suffer the anguish that used regularly to drive you to tearful despair. phone, perhaps a reminder of the modern age that we live in and that Princess Diana so typified. Back to the car, making its way out of North London. That, if I'm not mistaken, is Hendon Way. Approaching uh, one of London's great shopping centers, Brent Cross. And from there, on to the North Circular Road. Some might say the dreaded North Circular Road. Always chock-a-block. And from there, up onto the M1. And in fact, uh, we've just heard that the police are asking mourners as they begin to gather on bridges over the M1 uh, not to throw flowers down from the bridges onto the car or indeed drape flags. As I said earlier, I don't have to believe it if I don't want to.
Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure to be here with you, sharing in your successes of the past year. In the past 12 years, I can honestly say that one of my greatest pleasures has been my association with people like yourself. During those years, I've met many thousands of wonderful and extraordinary people, both here and around the world. The cared for and the carers. To the wider public, may I say that I've made many special friends. I've been allowed to share your thoughts and dreams, your disappointments and your happiness. You have also given me an education by teaching me more about life and living than any books or teachers could have done. My debt of gratitude to you all is immense. I hope in some small way I have been of service in return.